Hello and welcome everyone. Happy Earth Day. I'm Trent Lobster with the School District of Palm Beach County Department of Educational Technology. I am so thrilled to be here with you today as we host an afternoon poetry workshop with Nicole Brown and Jessica Jacobs. Our visiting poets and authors are joining us today in celebration of National Poetry Month and thanks to our partners at the Palm Beach Poetry Festival. Uh, founded in 2005, the Palm Beach Poetry Festival is a nonprofit organization dedicated to fostering the writing, reading, performance, and appreciation of poetry by presenting an annual festival and other poetry events in Palm Beach County, featuring America's finest poets. Their annual high school poetry competition takes place every December, so mark your calendars. And their poetry performance outreach project, started by Dr. Blaze Allen, has brought many world-renowned poets into our high schools over the last 17 years to inspire our students. More information about the Palm Beach Poetry Festival can be found at palmbeachpoetryfestival.org. And speaking of poets and inspiration, today's honored guests are Jake, Jessica Jacobs and Nicole Brown. Nicole Brown is the author of Sister, a novel in poems, and Fanny Say, a biography in poems. Currently, she lives in Asheville, North Carolina, where she periodically volunteers at several animal sanctuaries. Since 2016, she's been writing about these animals. And To Those Who Were Our First Gods, a chapbook of these first poems, won the 2018 Rattle Prize. Her essay in poems, The Donkey Elegies, was published in 2020. Nicole and her wife, Jessica, regularly teach together as part of their Sun June Literary Collaborative. Jessica Jacobs is the author of Take Me With You Wherever You're Going, winner of the Devil's Kitchen and Goldie Awards and Pelvis with Distance, winner of the New Mexico Book Award and finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. She serves as chapbook editor for the Beloit Poetry Journal and lives in Asheville with her wife, Nicole Brown. Her collection of poems in conversation with the Book of Genesis will be out from Four Way Books in 2024. So looking forward to that. And in 2021, Spruce Books of Penguin Random House published this book right here, Write It, 100 Poetry Prompts to Inspire, co-authored by Nicole and Jessica. So I'm going to bring Nicole and Jessica into the room. Nicole and Jessica, hello. Hi. How Hi. are you? Hi. You so we much. are so excited to have you here today. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that the people are tired of hearing me talk at this point. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to give you the floor and for you to, to share your knowledge with uh, with all the students and teachers that are watching from the classroom. Well, thank you so much for setting this all up, Trent. Thank you. Thank you. And, and before we begin, I just want to say a word about the Palm Beach Poetry Festival, which has been such a dear, dear place to me for years now, um, run by Miles and Mimi Kuhn. And then, of course, uh, Blaze Allen, who does the community outreach there. It's been a, a really special place. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we just wanted to tell you a little bit about ourselves and how we came to be here with you today. Um, yeah. So um, we have both been writing since we were kids. And by the way, I'm Nicole. And I'm, I'm this Jessica. Is my wife, Jessica. Mm -hmm. And we've both been writing since we were kids. Um, matter of fact, I wrote some of my first magnificently failed poems in Deerfield Beach when I was living with my grandmother Fanny and uh, tried my 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 first uh, my first poems back a long time ago now yeah. um, but it's been um, a really important way in terms of how I have found my place in 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 the world um, Poetry, and, and I don't think I would be exaggerating to say that the poetry has saved me. And a lot of this has to do with um, finding my voice, with articulating things I wouldn't have a way to tell the story of otherwise. But it's also more than that. I think that when you are an artist, when you are a writer, um, it gives your life a certain kind of focus one that um, insists that you look at the world even when you feel like turning away. And um, poetry then has held me to a certain kind of standard and that hasn't always been comfortable for me, but it has been my job um, for a really long time to, to notice things, to pay attention, and then of course to, to, write, to write it down. 
Yeah, and um, I grew up uh, a little bit north of you all, uh, outside of Orlando. And for me, um, I was kind of a lonely kid. I was a little weird. I loved books. I loved being outside. And that wasn't really true of a lot of the people around me. And for me, um, books, all different kinds, you know, novels, poetry, it showed me that the world was so much bigger than the world that I saw around me. And it let me know that there were people who, you know, saw the world the way that I did and they were waiting for me. Um, and it was a way of feeling less alone. Mm -hmm. And so when I grew up and I knew I wanted to write the fact that, you know, we get to be here with you all today and, you know, keep you company with some of our poems um, is really, really exciting. And we love the idea that, you know, maybe some of the prompts we give you today will inspire you to write some poems of your own. Yeah, yeah. And so. when we got married in um, 2013, one of the things we started to do was to tour. And so generally speaking, like, today's visit, we would be there with you. So we're just pretending <laughs> that we are there with you in South Florida today, because we really love being in the company of um, young writers. It's, 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 it's one of our, our greatest gifts, I think, of this life. And um, we uh, gave hundreds of, of different readings. We went to many, many different classrooms. And we had the opportunity then to write out some of these yeah. prompts, which is the book that that Trent uh, <laughs> showed us. you. And it, it's, it's kind of a journal. And you'll see um, that there's a lot of blank space in the book for your words, because your words are more important in this book than ours. We're just throwing ideas your way and trying to inspire you and um, encourage you. So I don't know um, if you're ready to join us, but we thought today what we would do would be to share six of the prompts from the books uh, with six of our own poems that sort of sprung from or out of the idea of those prompts to sort of give you an idea of perhaps where we arrived and then you can look at it and be like i got a better idea than that you know <laughs> and please outdo us because that's what we want yeah so um before we get started we hope that you have um, a piece of paper and something to write with mm -hmm. um, because i know a lot of times when i go to poetry readings and i'm listening to someone I, I want to pretend I'm 100% listening, but sometimes, you know, I'm going to hear something and it gives me an amazing idea and you have to write it down right away so you don't lose it. So we hope that, you know, we can't see you, but even if we could, we would be honored if instead of, you know, totally listening, maybe you are writing something yeah. of your own. And, and do keep in mind, so this is recorded, as you know, and so if we go too quickly and you need time to catch up and do this writing yourself and try it, push pause. And then come back and we'll give you another prompt, you know, so you can go at your own pace. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Let's get started. Let's get started. Oh, putting the glasses on and get started. <laughs> um, yeah. So the first thing I wanted to start with uh, is your name, right? And all of us, all of us, we are called by so many different names, mm -hmm. right? Um, our first name. Sometimes we're called by our last name. Sometimes if you raise, if you were raised in the family I did and you got your first, middle, and your last name, you knew you were in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so we call that the full Christian name. Um, and then, of course, those names that you're called in the hallway at school, maybe that, you don't, that don't really feel good, that may, may not be true to who you are, or maybe just things that you carry with you. Um, and then, of course, um, there are those, those nicknames right, that you carry. And a lot of times they speak to the best parts of ourselves. Um, they speak to uh, the name that you like to be called by those that really care about you. Um, for me, that nickname was always Koei, K-O-E-Y. My name is Nicole. Hmm. There are a thousand riffs on Nicole, as you all know, Nick, Nikki, Coco, Coco, <laughs> right? Koei. Koei was the name I loved primarily because my grandmother called me that name. And um, a lot of my poems uh, that I'm going to share with you today are about my grandmother. That was my, my second book was dedicated to her. Um, and she was the one that that raised me. And, and I'll say that that poetry, too, is a lot about sound. 
a lot about uh, the, the, the words in your mouth, the shape that they make, the taste of those words. And sometimes if you really think about your name, you can think of your name as a song, right? And what that song is and the way that it's spelled and what it carries. And you'll see here on the page two, we, there's this prompt and it opens with this quote by uh, Paul Valery. And it's, seeing is forgetting the name of the thing one sees. So what does that mean? That's kind of weird, but that's about looking at something hard enough and long enough until it becomes strange, until it becomes new again. Mm -hmm. So what could be more familiar to you than your own name, right? Mm -hmm. So can you forget your own name? Now, one way to do this is by saying your name over and over and over and over and over until the sounds get really weird, you know, until the sounds start to garble and they start to slide. And, you know, then you think about like what kind of sounds your name makes when it quits making sense. Can you translate um, a statement um, can you can you can you translate each syllable into a statement of surprising self introduction into a language of its own? Did you want to no, say no, something? No. Um, so um, what you need to know is that I tried this. I sat down and I said, "Koi, Koi, 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 Koi," right? And I'm really glad I was there by myself because everyone was <laughs> like, "Ooh, the poet has really lost her mind now." But what I was trying to do was to make my name new again, and before I share this poem with you, you should know that I didn't come from a family of books. I didn't come from a family of art. My grandmother never graduated high school. She never really learned to read or write very well. So she spelled things in her very own special way. And one of those things that she did is she was there when my young mother gave birth to me and she spelled my name quite differently, which has caused me a lot of inconvenience in my life, hmm. N-I-C-K-O-L-E. Um, but I grew up and I began to love that K. Um, and so I will um, share that poem with you. And then I hope um, on a piece of paper, you're going to write down that name that you love and think about the, the history that it carries and how it feels in your own mouth. This is called Fanny Linguistics. Nicole. Fanny Linguistics, Nicole. What people don't know about my name is that my grandmother gave me that K, my very own unexpected consonant, those two strong arms and two strong legs, that broom handle spine, hmm. that letter about no one with a name same as mine has. A miss Spelling, really, the same botched phonetics of all her girls' names, misspelled but fancy as chandeliers. Latana Lee, Candy Lorraine, Lisa Annette, and you can see how those are spelled on the screen versus how they're pronounced, right? So Latana Lee, Candy Lorraine, Lisa Annette, names that know never to drink lemon water from a silver finger bowl, but names that can be bobbed with a Y and cheerlead. Now, she called me Koei, so don't expect me to respond to the first nasal tone of my name, but the harsher cough that follows, that typo tambourined from the back of the throat. I'll answer to cold and coal and coke, sometimes even hear that sound as a scoop of cocoa, something dry from the tin, but warmed with a little sugar and milk, a name snowing while it's safe inside. Hmm. That's great. Um, oh, thank Go you. ahead, <laughs> Jesse. All right. Um, only, <laughs> just so you know, only only family gets to call me that. So, <laughs> um, so along with your name, um, another great place to get started with your writing is to go back to the very beginning, right? So your name is one beginning. Um, another beginning is where is the place and people that you come from? Um, so if you could go to that next uh, prompt, Trent, thank you. Um, so here's 
a little prompt about that. In the poem, Where I'm From, the poet Georgella Lyon wrote, I am from clothespins, from Clorox and carbon tetrachloride. I am from the dirt under the back porch. I am from the Dutch elm whose long gone limbs I remember as if they were my own. So using her lines as a guide, can you make a list of where you're from, right? Of the many things that made your very, very specific home, right? And so this, what this is asking you to do is to make something that's called a list poem. It's as simple as it sounds like a grocery list, right? You make a list that each item tells you one more new thing about whatever it is that you're describing. And the power of the poem comes from how all of those items add up, how they enter into conversation with each other. And the more specific you can make them, the better, right? So for Georgella Lyon, she's not just from dirt, right? Which is kind of general. She's from dirt under the back porch, mm -hmm. right? See how much more specific that is. It lets us see her house a little bit. Um, so I'm going to share a poem with you that I, mean, I wrote it. I was feeling so stuck. Maybe you feel this way when you get, you know, an assignment in class and I had to write a poem for, for graduate school and I just, I just couldn't do it. I just didn't, I don't know. I didn't have anything to write about. Mm -hmm. And so just for fun, you know, just as a way of, of filling time, um, I started to make a list of what are all the things that I know because I grew up in Florida, hmm. right? That only a kid who knows up in, who grows up in Florida would know, right? Um, and so at, a lot of these things I imagine are gonna sound familiar to you. Um, if they inspire your own memory of something that you know because of where you've grown up, um, make, make, a, make some notes on it, right? Maybe that's gonna be a poem of your own. Um, and you can even think about, you know, what someone who grew up in your neighborhood, what would they know that nobody else would know? Or someone who grew up in your very specific family, right? What would they know? Um, so here's, here's my version of this poem. All right. Uh, primer. A Florida child knows the safest part of a lake is the middle that gators and moccasins shade in the lilies, hunker shoreline in the muck just past the trucked in sand. Knows a snake egg means a mother is nearby and angry. That to kill her, you must bring a shovel down right behind her skull. Leave too much neck and the headed half will keep coming at you. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Knows to run zigzag if a gator gives chase. Their squat digger legs built for speed, not for turning. Has a friend who has a friend who lost a thumb to a snapping turtle. Has worn live lizards as earrings. Watched lake caught minnows devour a store-bought birthday goldfish has been dragged on a field trip to a sinkhole wide as a roller rink. A red truck at the bottom wheels up, along with half a house and a wreck of toys and books. Has been told it happened on a day like any other. Has gone home to tread water at the lake's calming center. Cool streamers of springs fluttering her thighs. The sun a constant, the sucking sound of a bath plug pulled her imagination. <laughs> I did not know how to run from a gator until I met Jessica. Now, I, <laughs> now you know. I hope I will remember. <laughs> so um, thank you. Yeah, and I love the list poem too. And it's so generative because you can even list things that you don't even think are important. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. just you're like, oh, that was just a part of my childhood. Like nobody remembers that. And you write it down, you know, and it, it, it make, creates a specific sense yeah. of, of place. Um, another thing that you should know is that poetry has a lot to do with um, being in your body. Right. So we oftentimes we think of poems and we think that poets are all, quote unquote, in their head. 
right? <laughs> that and that poems would naturally just come from your memories, your thoughts, your brain, right? But really, when you think about how a poem works and what makes a poem kind of juicy and interesting and real is when you think about what your senses can bring you, what you smell, what you taste, what you hear, right? What you see, you know, what your skin can give you. All of these things are really, really important. And um, this next prompt actually is based off of uh, a poem by a poet that you guys just met in January. Her name is um, Amy Nezakumatato. And um, <clears throat> she's really quite extraordinary. In, in the poem that I use in the prompt, um, she uh, uh, gets to um, the idea of, of smell and what <laughs> smell can bring you. And the poet Diane Ackerman actually referred to smell as the mute sense because smell is one of those things that we don't always have ready words for. We don't always have ready vocabulary for them. And let me tell you, anytime you hmm. encounter anything in this world and people are like, gosh, I don't know. I really can't find the words for that or I really can't put my finger on that thing. And you're like, ha ha, that is a place for a poem <laughs> because poetry deals with things that are really kind of slippery and ineffable and difficult to explain. Um, and uh, when it comes to smell, if I ask you, say how an orange smells, you might say, well, it smells like an orange, right? But write a poem about it, it comes to life. So Trent, if you could pull up that prompt. So um, human animals that we are, <laughs> Much of our desire is dependent on how someone smells to us. As poet Amy Nezakumatato wrote, when Cleopatra received Anthony on her cedarwood ship, she made sure he would smell her in advance across the sea. I knew I had you when you told me you could not live without my scent. So the question then, is there someone you like who's close enough to smell. If not, imagine or remember them, then describe their scent in precise detail, allowing how you feel to rise up in that description. So maybe y'all are sniffing around the classroom right now, maybe <laughs> you're not. But I do want to say, I do want to share a poem with you, one of mine. And of course, this is not a love interest. This is one of my grandmother poems. And um, I had to write about my grandmother because Lord have mercy, did she wear the same perfume every single day? And it was really, really recognizable. They were just like, you could you could smell her before she came in the room. And when she <laughs> left, you could tell she had gone because there would still be a little cloud of her left behind. And um, I was in the grocery store years after my grandmother had died and um, smelled someone with her perfume on. And um, this poem is about that. And you're going to see some references in here to pop culture and to Hollywood, trying to evoke the glamour of the era that she was embodying with that perfume. So for my grandmother's perfume, Norel, because your generation didn't wear perfume, but chose a scent a signature. Every day you spritzed a powerhouse floral with top notes of lavender and mandarin, a loud smell, one part Doris Day, that girl next door who used Technicolor to find a way to laugh about husbands with their secretaries over lunch, the rest all Faye Dunaway, all high drama extensions of nails and lashes, your hair a breezy fall of bangs, a stiletto entrance that knew to walk sideways, hip first. Now watch a real lady descend the stairs. Launched in 1968, Norelle was the 1950s tingling with the beginning of disco. Norelle was a housewife tired of gospel, mopping her house to Stevie Wonder. Instead, you wore so much of it, tiny pockets of your ghost lingered hours after, after you were gone. And last month, 
I stalked a woman wearing your scent through the grocery so long I abandoned my cart and went home. Fanny, tell me, how can manufactured particles carry you through the air? I always express what I see, but it was no photo that stopped and queased me to my knees. After all these years, you were an invisible trace. And in front of a tower of soup cans, I was a simple animal craving the deep memory worn by a stranger oblivious of me. If I had courage, the kind of fool I'd like to be, I would have pressed my face to her small shoulder and with the sheer work of two pink lungs, I would have breathed enough to conjure you back to me. Mm, that's beautiful. Um, so as Nicole says, you know, part of our job just as people in the world, but also as writers is paying attention, right? Paying attention to the people around you, especially the people, you know, that you're moved by, whether in anger or love or, you know, whatever it is, um, but also paying attention to the places around you. So if we could look at this, we'll start with the prompt. Um, okay, this starts with a quote from the poet David Wagner. Mm -hmm. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The force knows where you are. You must let it find you. So the prompt is, draw a simple map of your location with an X marking the spot where you are. And think about what are the challenges that you over, overcame to get to that spot? Mm -hmm. And what are the treasures that you found being present to this one ordinary place? Right, because paying attention can make an ordinary place extraordinary. And what you notice doesn't just tell you about where you are, but who you are. Right, it, it, what, what you are noticing says something about you. Um, so for me, I haven't lived in Florida since I was 18 years old. Um, so I've had a really long time to think about that X on the map of where I came mm -hmm. from. Um, so for me, when I was pretty young, I realized like a lot of people, right? Some people are born in one place and they love it and they stay there forever. And for me, it was really clear that I like to rock climb. I like snow, you know, things that Florida couldn't quite give me, right? But <laughs> yeah. Um, but that said, there are so many things about Florida that I love. There's so many people in Florida that I love that I can't stop writing about it. Um, and I really wanted to understand that relationship. So what I did was I wrote something called an apostrophe. Um, and an apostrophe is not just like that little mark of punctuation, but it can also mean a poem that is written like a letter to someone or something that can't answer. So in my case, um, I wrote a letter to Florida. It's kind of like a Dear John letter, if you're familiar with that Taylor Swift song, like a little, a little breakup poem for, for me in Florida to say like why it wasn't going to work out, but I still really care about Florida anyway. It's not me, it's you. It's not me, it's you. It's, well, I mean, yeah. That, <laughs> it's me, you. it's not you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so to, to Florida. In the citrus light of winter, I stole oranges from your trees. Through your white sand tore bike tracks ragged as rope burns. In you, I was a primal thing. For years, I carried a keychain in your image, my name stamped along its length. We were always claiming you, weren't we? Your every pine a scarred tally of who loved whom and when. But even before I could brush my own hair, I marched into my parents' room and declared, I'm not from here. <laughs> By here, of course, I meant you. Though I'd never seen them, I dreamt of mountains, of a landscape tall enough to contain me. So yes, my first betrayal of you was that early, that inconsolable. 
At Ponce de Leon's fountain, eternal youth had an egg rot stink. I wouldn't drink. All I wanted was to grow old enough to leave you. Florida, we never had a chance. Empty buzzsaw of jet skis, creatures lurking the darkness of our dock and other darknesses too. The swack of girls' thighs leaving the seat of my car, all the lip glossed mouths from which I couldn't look away. Land of mowed lawns, state of mere perpetual summer, in you my longing knew no seasons, no dormancy. Eighteen years was enough, but my night mind grieves you. Now that I don't have to, I come home often, for in my dreams I just remember. Swim and swim through a day when sun columns your water into a great hall, silt sifting like dust motes through the light, a hall where all my earliest incarnations sit down to feast while I skim that water's skin, calling down to the ones I used to be. I love to think about you walking to your parents' room and be like, I'm not from here. <laughs> they can verify it. Yes. Poor kid. <laughs> I might have been doing something similar. Um, so it, for the past, Six years. Uh, what I've been doing is lending a hand at uh, a farm sanctuary. I work with um, cows and chickens and ducks and pigs and goats and sheep and no gators. But <laughs> y'all could work with gators down in Florida. Um, and then I've also been doing some wildlife wildlife rehab work. Um, and, and what all of this has done for me, um, it's made me think of animals with their own kind of personhood, not just personalities, but personhood, um, meaning that they have their own desires, they have their own longings in the world, their own needs, their own loves. And um, it shifted how I think of myself as a poet. So my first two books were about my family, you know, were about growing up and, 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 and what it was like um to 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 be among the people that that i knew as a kid and i started to shift with working with animals and i started to think about not just other humans points of view but non-human points mm -hmm. of view you know what are those those living things outside of our own species that that have a voice and um Today, as you know, um, is Earth Day, hmm. and um, like a lot of you, I'm deeply worried um, about the state of our planet and how we might be guardians of the birds, guardians of the trees, how we might protect and love creatures that are outside just our own kind. Um, so Trent, if you could pull up the prompt um, in this prompt is, uh, of course, when we think of others, we cannot forget the non-human beings with which we share our lives and this planet. So the prompt is to consider one animal you've encountered, be it a pet or a bird outside the window mate right now, maybe an elephant that you saw at the zoo. Um, their life is completely independent of yours, of course, but also because we are the dominant species, um, their lives are entirely dependent on our choices as human beings. So describe perhaps maybe what that animal perceives of you, what questions they might ask of you, um, what requests or demands they might make of you if they could speak. And I will uh, share the last poem of mine, and then Jessica has one more poem. And um, But the thing that I want you to remember, of course, is that poetry isn't just about you and your experience, but being aware enough, perhaps, of those others around you and, and maybe speaking for and about them. So this is called A Prayer to Talk to Animals. 
Lord, I ain't asking to be the beast master, gem ripped in a jungle loincloth or a Dr. Doolittle or <laughs> even the expensive vet down the street, that stethoscoped redhead, her diamond ring big as a Cracker Jack toy. All I want is for you to help me flip off this light box in its scroll of dread, to rip a tiny tear between this world and that, a slit in the veil, Lord, one of those old fashioned peeping keyholes through which I can press my dumb lips and speak. If you will, Lord, make me the teeth hot in the mouth of a raccoon scraping the junk I scraped from last night's plates. Make me the blue eye of that young crow cocked to me, too selfish to even look up from the flash of my phone. Oh, forgive me, Lord, how human I've become, busy clicking what I like, busy pushing my cuticles back and back to expose all 10 pale, useless moons. Would you let me tell your creatures how sorry I am? Let them know exactly what we've done. Am I not an animal too? If so, Lord, make me one again. Give me back my dirty claws and blood warm horns. Braid back those long frayed strands of every nerve tingling with all I thought I had to do today. Fork my tongue, Lord. There is a sorrow on the air I taste but cannot name. I want to open my mouth and know the exact flavor of what's to come. I want to open my mouth and sound a language that calls all language home. Mm. I, I don't think you all could hear it, but out our window in our backyard, there were birds calling the entire time Nicole was reading that. So <laughs> they were they were answering me back. They were speaking. Um, so for my last poem, um, I figured why not let let's end with with a love poem. Um, and I don't know about you, but they're really, I find love poems really hard to write, right? And, and why they're so hard is because most love poems are just boring, right? They're too expected. They're like a Hallmark card. My love for you is a red, red rose. You're as beautiful as the moon, right? Like all these things mm -hmm. that are just like yawn. Yes, thank you. Very expected. Um, so how do you do that, right? How do you write a poem that is hopefully effective and that really expresses how you feel about someone, right? Which is very specific. Um, so one of the ways to do that is to write something that is surprising in a love poem that, that maybe, you know, doesn't seem like it should fit in a love poem. And maybe you can even make it a little bit weird, right? And there's an example of that in this next prompt um, that you'll see from um, the surrealist poet, uh, Andre Breton. So he wrote a list poem, right? We're going to stay on theme, a list poem that described his wife with wrists of matches. Surprising. Okay, so they're Just thin. Yeah, they're very slender. Maybe they can light something on fire. Um, with buttocks of swan's backs, that would fall in the weird category. I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> with eyes of water to be drunk in prison. Oh, so like you're so thirsty and you don't have access to water and you looking in your eyes is like getting that drink. Amazing. Um, so now the prompt is think of a beloved or maybe just your first crush. Now describe them in a list that plays fast and loose, associating not for sense, but for feeling right for how you feel about something. Um, so for the poem I'm going to share with you. It's also a list poem, and I wanted to write an ode, right? An ode is a poem of celebration, and I wanted to celebrate my love for Nicole, right? And how amazing it is to find someone to spend your life with that makes you this happy. And I was thinking, okay, what am I going to celebrate? And I thought, well, Nicole's got pretty awesome hair. So I figured I would write an ode to her hair. Um, and part of the very serious work of poetry was laying on the couch and trying to think about twisty things. 
that I could use to describe. You'll hear those at the end. Um, and to provide contrast, right, to, to provide surprise, I also tried to think about, well, what were some things that were maybe difficult about her hair, right? Especially when she was younger and didn't know how to totally manage it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and to put that in a love poem. All right. So a nice way to put it. So this poem um, starts with a quote from the poet uh, Pablo Neruda. Other lovers want to live with particular eyes. I only want to be your stylist. Curly, my tangler. Who needs Rumpelstiltskin when such treasure abounds? Her gold woven around my bike gears, tangled in my toothbrush, vining every drain, even sometimes found in my mouth upon waking. And just this morning from the bathroom, she called me in. My mama's the only one who ever brushed out my hair, she said, but you are my wife you should know. I began at the bottom, her curls separating with the thick sound of good cloth tearing. Do you see why I had no friends when I was little? She asked. So Mama brushed out my hair each day before school. It was really big. Um, I eased my fingers for the first time all the way through, asked how that felt for her. Vulnerable, she said shimmering out beneath the overhead light, a climbing of kudzu, a symphony of trumpet vines. Her hair revealed itself. It was like Velcro, she said. Anything would stick in it. Bubble gum, spit wads, pencils. I'd come home crying and mama would hold my ugly frizzy head and say, baby, they're just jealous. As though her love could make the lie so. When it comes to her, her mother and I have this kind of love in common. Only now the lie has come to pass. My wife, whose hair is the shade of farm fresh yolks, the color of things rich on the tongue, whose hair sings the plaintive song of bed springs, whose hair is the drifting smoke from a village of chimneys, corkscrews enough for a thousand bottles of wine. A ski slope of S-curves, a grove of twirling maple keys, every playground slide worth sliding. Before a rapt audience, a company of ballerinas cambers their hands to trace out in the air your hair. My dear Angora goat, my cloud of bats, spiraling from the cave. Thank you. And yes, yeah, so I let her call me an Angora goat. In <laughs> True love. Thank you so much, uh, Nicole and Jessica. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if it's cool, I can, I'm gonna bring you guys down for a minute and then I'll bring you back up to say goodbye while I go through some, oh. uh, some upcoming events and stuff like that. Um, again, thank you so much. That was, that was awesome. I really enjoyed it. And I know that our students and teachers are gonna enjoy, you know, what, what the impetus was behind uh, a lot of these, these works, you know, where, where your mind was and what you were thinking before you even put the pen to the page. That stuff is always, you know, as, as writers, it's just really cool to see the process. Um, so I'll, I'll bring you back up in a second to say our final goodbyes. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I'll go through some really boring stuff. Just kidding. Everybody stick around. Um, so it's just a reminder that in uh, with like all of our recordings uh, in, in live streams, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel right here uh, after the stream ends. So if you had to, you know, go between classes or switch between, uh, it, you know, if you weren't able to catch the whole thing, it'll be here um, after the stream is done. Um, and just uh, a couple of words about some upcoming events. Um, we've got uh, from our, uh, our friends in the, the uh, Department of uh, Teaching and Learning, um, the Future Authors Workshop is, uh, is happening um, June uh, 6th to 9th and 13th to 16th. It's an eight-day workshop, um, but applications are due for this soon. So if you are a future writer and you want to sharpen your writing and editing and publishing, um, skills and you want to have some conversations with uh, some local authors, um, applications for this are due on Monday. So um, if, uh, if you'd like, um, you can reach out to the Department of Teaching and Learning, but I've also included in the link 
um, sorry, in the description of this video, there are links to that application. Um, so you can, you can check it out. And then we've also got um, some events in the Department of Educational Technology. We've got, uh, for the teachers out there, we've got our FINDS uh, research model series. Um, that is kind of a collaborative effort between some of the ed tech members and those in library media. Um, so if you want to learn more about the FINDS research model, um, it's, uh, you've got uh, videos that are being premiered um, every Wednesday. Um, starting a couple weeks ago. So there's a couple episodes already out. And, um, and so you can you can catch those uh, again here on our YouTube channel. And we've got a couple of exciting virtual learning experiences. Um, we're going to have a, a ranger from Yellowstone National Park. And um, we're also going to be um, uh, hosting one with the Loggerhead Marine Life Center. So that's Tuesday, May 24th, and Wednesday, May 25th. So keep an eye on the, uh, the EdTech training team calendar. Um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's uh, bit.ly forward slash ET training. Um, so we've, uh, da, 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 I think, yeah, I think that pretty much covers that. So um, on behalf of all of us at the School District of Palm Beach County, uh, Ed Tech team and um, uh, the Palm Beach Poetry Festival, um, we are so very thankful that you were able to join us today. Uh, and, and Nicole and Jessica, thank you so much for sharing your words and wisdom with us. And uh, I'll, I'll leave you with the final goodbye. Gosh, thank you so much for, for having us. This was, this was a real joy. Yeah, it was, it was a delight to, to virtually visit Florida. So thank you. It was an <laughs> honor. All right, everyone. Thanks for spending the afternoon with us. Take care. Take care.